Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Monday, everybody. I hope you all had a lovely weekend, and for those who celebrate it, I hope you had a lovely、uh, Christmas yesterday with your family. Today's episode will be a little bit shorter than usual, and just a piece of housekeeping at the beginning of today's video: there is a possibility that、uh, tomorrow and Wednesday there may not be、uh, episodes. So if there is no episode that goes up tomorrow on Tuesday, no need to panic. It should be back to regular episodes by Thursday. First up for today's episode, however, yesterday Sunday. Christmas Day, the People's Liberation Army staged drills around Taiwan, with the Eastern Theater Command announcing, "Quote: The Eastern Theater Command, the PLA, organized joint combat readiness patrols and joint firepower strike drills in airspace and waters around Taiwan on December 25th." End quote. Adding, quote, "It was a resolute response to the escalating collusion and provocation by the United States and Taiwan. The command's troops will take all necessary measures to firmly defend national sovereignty and territorial integrity." End quote. The so-called provocation by the United States is likely referring to the signing in Washington of the U.S. National Defense Authorization Act for the new financial year, which included the so-called Taiwan Enhanced Resilience Act. The legislation, which was signed on Saturday, authorizes up to 10 billion U.S. dollars in grants and loans for security assistance over the next five years, and encourages Taiwanese forces to take part in U.S.-led multinational naval exercises. The Russian invasion. Of Ukraine, as well as increased mainland military exercises around Taiwan, especially after the Pelosi visit earlier this year, has caused Washington policymakers to reevaluate America's Taiwan policy. Defense experts say that the nature of the funding suggests that Taiwan could get more sophisticated weapons from the United States, particularly much-needed warships. Quote: In previous arms deals between Taipei and Washington, Taiwan didn't need any grants and loans because Taiwan's financial revenue could come. Cover all the weapons procured. Taiwan's navy does need more warships. They don't have to be too big, but enough to deal with increasing challenges and provocations from the PLA. Taiwanese ports are not deep enough to accommodate massive ships, so the best idea is for the U.S. side to provide Taiwan with its agile, multi-role, freedom-class littoral combat ships. End quote. Outspoken mainland commentators warn of a new arms race and the heightened risk of military accidents. Quote, the U.S. wants to use terror to sell more weapons to Taiwan, which is in Washington's interest. A new arms race would increase the chance of military conflict, accidents, and misjudgment between Beijing and Taipei, of which both sides should remain cautious. End quote. The Sunday military drills included the incursions of 47 aircraft set across the medium line of the Taiwan Strait. The drills had also followed naval exercises by a Chinese aircraft carrier group in the Western Pacific, close to Japan, on Friday. According to Japan's defense ministry, 180 carrier-based fighter jets and helicopters took off and landed on the Liaoning aircraft carrier. We remember earlier this month, Japan unveiled a new national security plan that signals the country's biggest military build-up since World War II, and the doubling of military spending. Okay, next up, China's first COVID wave continues to surge, with some cities likely now reaching their peaks. One such city is the highly sensitive capital Beijing. Despite being comparatively well resourced, the capital city's healthcare system is already greatly strained, and it is now being reported that several provinces have sent medical teams to assist in the capital. Chinese financial media outlet Taishin writes today that teams of medical workers, including senior doctors, have been dispatched from Shandong, Hubei, Hunan, Sichuan, and Jiangsu provinces to Beijing to treat seriously ill patients. Quote, While it's not uncommon for regions to mobilize medical staff to help contain outbreaks in other areas, this cross-regional support is seen as unacceptable to many local health officials and frontline workers, who said the current wave of COVID is affecting the entire country, and that medical resources are stretched everywhere. 
end quote. Beijing was among the major cities first hit by the surging outbreak since the reversal of China's so-called zero COVID policy a few weeks ago now, with hospitals being hit hard there last week in particular. Local media in the city have published video of overcrowded emergency departments and bed shortages in many hospitals in the capital. Across the country, the government is increasing production and distribution of traditional Chinese medicine. Some provinces have already delivered hundreds of thousands of boxes of special orders of one medicine in particular, called Lianhua Qingwen, but public opinion within China itself is divided over the effectiveness of this medicine as a treatment for COVID and its symptoms. After the delivery of half a million boxes of Chinese medicine to the southern province of Yunnan last week, netizens complained online that they needed more ibuprofen and paracetamol, not traditional Chinese medicine prompting the provincial government there in a statement online to say that they were working to increase production of these modern drugs too. Lianhua Qingwen was first promoted by Beijing back in April 2020 as a recommended treatment for fever and coughs for those suffering from mild cases of COVID. Earlier this year, it was included in an anti-epidemic kit distributed to every household in Hong Kong when Hong Kong was going through its first surge after the beginnings of opening up. However, some countries, including the United States, Australia and Singapore, have warned against the use of this particular traditional drug. Meanwhile, yesterday, Sunday, the National Health Commission said in a brief statement that China will cease publishing official daily cases. As we have discussed for almost two weeks now, the official numbers have been of almost no use, with experts and the public alike grimly aware that they are dramatically undercounting the true infection rate across the country, which is likely now in the millions by the day. On Saturday, China reported only 4,128 cases and no new deaths. The National Health Commission had been releasing daily figures on COVID-19 infections since January 21st, 2020. Several local governments and media outlets have been publishing far more accurate estimates, radically different to the now discontinued official count. For example, yesterday, the eastern province of Zhejiang reported daily new infections in the province had crossed 1 million by the day, with 2 million cases a day expected as a peak by early January. According to state-run Qingdao Daily, the Shandong Ni city is seeing 490,000 to 230,000 COVID cases every day. Dongguan, near Guangzhou, in the south claims similar levels. In Hangzhou, the Zhejiang provincial capital, an hour from Shanghai and home to Alibaba, local hospitals have called for volunteers to help its ambulance center meet the surging demand for medical assistance. On Saturday, we discussed the leaked, unverified memo from the National Health Commission meeting last week, which estimated nearly 248 million, or about 18% of China's population, has been infected with COVID-19 during the first 20 days of December. It does appear now that most major cities are now about to reach peak new cases. The concern currently for public officials is the transmission to more lower tier cities and rural areas as folks travel home for Chinese New Year, which falls in late January. These regions are far less well resourced to manage the case surges, and this is perhaps where we will see most of the crisis unfold. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to hit that like button. As always, anyone who can go that extra mile and help keep the channel sustainable, Patreon and Buy Me a Coffee links are in the description below. Like I said, there is a chance that tomorrow and Wednesday there will not be any uh, videos. Um, hopefully there will be, but if they're not, I will see you back here on Thursday. Thank you so much, everybody, for all the support. Thank you for watching, and I will see you next time on China Update.